Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Obviously, I, I am an American, and that means I am a bit of a rebel. Uh, after my talk today, I hope that you will see yourselves as rebels too, rebels in the defense of marriage, standing up for true liberty and true rights. What do I mean that we are rebels in the fight for marriage? What I mean is simply this. The National Organization for Marriage has been the major funder, and I have served on the executive committee, for all of the successful marriage fights in the United States, the ballot initiatives, over the last four years. In California, the elites, those in power, told us that there was absolutely no chance that the people of California would vote to protect marriage as the union of a man and a woman. They said, California is a liberal state. What are you doing? You are going to run an initiative and you're going to lose. Instead, we went to California and we helped get a message out, a positive message. Instead of accepting the notion that somehow conservative values and ideas are outdated, we put forward the true consequences of same-sex marriage. We were positive in the ads that we ran. And at the end of the day, 52.5% of Californians voted to protect marriage as the union of a man and a woman. I will remind you that this is the same margin that President Obama won the election in California. So for those in the liberal media who would say, that's quite a small margin, well, they weren't saying that about President Obama's election in California. From there, I served on the executive committee of the fight in Maine. The legislature in Maine voted to redefine marriage. But there's one problem. In Maine, the people have the right to gather signatures and to overturn any law passed by the legislature. We helped to gather the signatures. We put together a coalition of Catholics, evangelicals, and some people of no faith at all. That coalition successfully overturned the law. Again, the same arguments. The elites said, there is no chance you'll win in Maine. It's a northeastern New England state, for goodness sake. It's strongly democratic. But instead, at the end of the day, a year after Proposition 8, the people of Maine voted by a larger percentage than California, over 53%, to protect marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Again, in Iowa, the Supreme Court of Iowa decided that it would enforce its own definition of marriage. The elites decided that they would impose their will and not listen to the people. Unanimously, the Iowa Supreme Court redefined marriage in the state of Iowa. This was a real shock because obviously the Midwest is not a place that accepts same-sex marriage. In Iowa, judges face retention elections. We organized a committee and worked closely with folks on the ground, again, of people of varying faiths. We were again told that this is impossible and the naysayers abounded. No judge in Iowa history has ever failed to win re-election. No judge. Three were up for re-election. All three were defeated. And guess what? They were defeated by 56%, so a larger margin. Finally, in North Carolina, a very strong constitutional amendment that defines marriage as the union of a man and a woman and bans any attempt to redefine marriage under a different name. This happened a month and a half ago. This is very recent history. We were told that the time is done, we've lost the marriage issue, forget about North Carolina. Well, guess what? The people of North Carolina voted now by 61% to protect marriage as the union of a man and a woman. What I want to convey to you is that when we say, when I say we are rebels, we are in a paradoxical situation. The elites throughout the Western world have abandoned marriage. This is a reality. The people, however, their intuition, their conscience, even those that aren't particularly religious, 
still understand this simple truth, that there's something unique and special about the union of one man and one woman. They may not believe that because of religious reasons. It may just be because their reason tells them of this. But if we can speak to their hearts, we can still win the marriage issue. There are three key components to any counterinsurgency. And elections for marriage are an example of a counterinsurgency. I spent a lot of time discussing this with a friend who was a general who fought in uh, counterinsurgency. And we came to this agreement. And that is, in order to win elections, we need three primary things. We need message, money, and muscle. In each of the campaigns that I've outlined, a lot of money was spent on researching what messages worked with the people of each of these states. The messages were not always the same. Now we know that the truth is on our side. We know that marriage is the union of a man and a woman. We know that because of our faiths, but pure reason allows us to get to this. Why do people in very different cultures over the span of eons of history all agree that there's something unique and special about a man and a woman? Cultures that don't have modern nation states still regulate the union of a man and a woman and dictate that there's something unique and special about it. Well, there are three reasons. One, that S -s -s relationships between men and women make babies. <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> Two, that society needs babies. Those societies which don't have babies are not a part of uh, those societies that anthropologists can go and research and, and be one of the many societies that we know much about. This is fairly simple. Number three, sounds simple but is actually profound. And that is that when a baby is born, there is bound to be a mother present. <laughs> However, marriage is that institution by which men and fathers are connected to any children that are born out of that relationship. Same-sex marriage, any attempt to redefine marriage, most profoundly uh, changes and alters the bond between fathers and any children that might be born. So without even getting into the, the reality that God has dictated in Scripture that marriage is the union of a man and a woman, we can know that there is something unique and special. In these fights, in some states, we've not referred to the fact that God is the author of marriage and the messaging. In California, the focus was on the consequences. We knew that Roughly 30% of Californians supported marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Perhaps 20% supported redefining marriage. And there was an in-between, the mushy middle, that could be convinced one way or the other. What convinced them? Consequences. What were the consequences? Well, the number one consequence was what would be taught in the schools. Parents soccer moms, those folks that weren't particularly religious, did not want their children taught in the schools that, that it was the same thing for Jimmy to grow up and marry Johnny as it was to marry Mary. They did not want their children to be taught in the schools that they were bigots, that their parents were bigots for believing in the simple truth that marriage was the union of a man and a woman. So one of the earliest ads showed what happened in Massachusetts, which was a book called King and King, distributed to first graders, teaching children that, that uh, this is absolutely normal and you need to learn about this in the public schools. Sometimes our opponents overreach. They hand us gifts. They had the superintendent of schools saying that we were lying. We were not lying. Two weeks later, a school teacher in San Francisco took her children to a same-sex wedding ceremony. How can you say that we are lying that this won't be taught in the schools when a teacher is taking their kids on a field trip to a same-sex marriage? This was one of our most powerful ads. It had a profound effect. However, in North Carolina, 
we were able to talk more about religion. North Carolina is a very religious state. And so when we opened up our ad, there's a picture of the Holy Bible, and it says, God created marriage. Who is man to redefine it? Very simple, but again, we won by 61%. As far as money, the California campaign was the most expensive social issue campaign in history, bar none. It cost $40 million on both sides. And I have to say that there were many people, including Catholic bishops, who stood up to raise money for this. But I will also say that it was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the individual members, who really stepped up and donated to make this amendment pass. And they deserve huge thanks from all of us for doing that. They also provided the muscle. There were over 100,000 volunteers in California. 100,000. That is a lot of people knocking door to door. Now, if we look at our opponents and we look at the field of battle, at times things seems, uh, the, the, the battle seems that we are completely um, overwhelmed. Uh, the National Organization for Marriage has a yearly budget of roughly $15 million. The Human Rights Campaign has a $40 million budget, and there are many other organizations fighting for same-sex marriage. They have all of the elites. But I encourage all of you to realize how you can change history in elections by simply looking at the fact that even though we are arrayed against all of these forces, if we are smart, if we do the best messaging we can, if we have the best political advice we can, if we have the money necessary, we don't even have to match the other side. If we get to half of their money, we can usually win. We've been able to win. Obviously, this is because of the prayers of many. But Paul tells us to both pray and act. And it is up to each of us to look at what has been effective throughout the world. Realize the field of battle. Realize that it is this fight is a fight in which the elites are against us, but in most places the people are still with, with us, even in, even in California. And that if we, if we are able to get our positive message out about the uniqueness, the beauty, the truth about marriage, we can win. Thank you very much.